dope. Today, guys, I know you from videos such as nutrition and leadership. Yeah. But yeah, today we're going to be talking about in 2013 anatomy and physiology by me, John. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the skeletal system. What is the skeletal system used for? Well, because the skeletal system is used for protection, movement, and support. Can anyone tell me what the skeletal system protects without looking at the boards? Asiana? Asiana? Sitiaza? Yeah, be there. To protect the vital organs. The vital organs. Oh, no, no. What, what do you say? What's it there to protect? Yeah. Vital organs. Yeah, correct. Vital organs. This prevents them from getting injured in any sort of clash. As well as the cranium also protecting the brain. Yeah, the brain is only has two plus two and stuff. So, movement. We're getting on to movement. We have support next after this. So, movement. The skeletal muscles are attached to bones via tendons, not ligaments, tendons. When a muscle contracts, this causes the bone also to move. Support. The skeletal. So the skeleton also provides framework for the body, which keeps our body upright, or otherwise we should be flat on the floor like jelly. And yeah. It provides attachments for muscles and soft tissues. Minerals. Minerals. <laughs> our bone tissue, our bone tissue, which store minerals like calcium and phosphorus. That's why all your mom said to you when you was young, drink milk, it's good for you. Did anyone ever say that to them? Okay, your mom loved you then. This is why. It's good to drink milk because the bone releases minerals into the bloodstream, maintaining mineral levels, blood cell production. Does anyone know? The bone marrow produces red and white blood cells, which is located in which type of bones? Can anyone tell me? Is it long bone? Long bone, long bone. So, what is red blood cells good for? Anyone know? What are red blood cells are good for? Carrying oxygen, they're also good for respiration in terms of when doing exercise. And they're important for gas exchange within the body. So, what are white blood cells good for? White blood cells are good for, you know, when your body's ill, fighting any flus, and you know, yeah, it keeps the immune system healthy. Long bones, the type of bones. So we have one, two, three, four, five type of bones here. Long bones, as first so. Long bones have a greater length and are usually tend to be curved, which is why they tend to be strong. Can anyone tell me a long bone by looking at the board? It's you. Femur. Femur. Femur is correct. Can anyone tell me another long bone? It's you, son, yeah. Uh, the humerus. The humerus. The humerus is correct. Short bones. Short bones are cube shaped, you know, ice cubes, and are approximately the same width and length. For example, the anyone know? Carpals. Carpals. I was gonna say no carpals, but yeah, you can say that. <clears throat> the flat bones. Flat bones are fin shaped with the structure being you know, I'll just come back to that one in a second, because it seems to be some sort of mix up here. Irregular bones. Irregular bones don't have a shape, you know, like in maths, you know, irregular shapes and that they have, you know, different lengths and different widths, you know. You see that regular um, square, regular pentagon, yeah. They 
come in all different shapes and sizes, like the spinal cord, which is an example. The sesamoid bones. Oops, sesamoid bones. In tendons, where locations produce great amounts of friction, for example, at the knee the patella. Well, this is a picture of the skeletal system. So as you can see, the cranium, mandible, and all sorts of other things. Um, yeah, can anyone tell me what type of bone the radius is? No one knows? No one? Okay, we're going to come back onto that because you ain't going to escape that one. You ain't either. You're watching at home. So, here we have a picture of the vertebral column. The vertebral column does many different things. You know, they send messages to each other, like, you know, MSN to our, yeah. So we have the cervical nerves, the thoracic nerves, the lumbar nerves, and the sacral nerves. So let's start with the sacral nerves, because it's closer to my head. So, you know, you've got different sections that do different jobs, like the bowel and the bladder. You know, you need to poo in that. They talk to the brain in that. They communicate, you know, you need, you need to... <clears throat> And then you've got stuff like the head and neck muscle and um, nerves communicating each other, the deltas, the biceps, and all the cervical nerves and stuff. So if if any of these were to get damaged, it wouldn't be very good. You know, because it affects the way you move. Or you could even get paralyzed if all of these nerves get affected because you wouldn't be able to feel your certain parts of the body. So the axial skeleton has two functions in the medial part of the body where it's located. This part of the body does not move. Sorry about the flag, man. They came from outside earlier, man. I don't know what it But you know, they have two functions to support and protect the organs in the medial part of the body and creates for attachment of muscles. The appendicular skeleton is the second part, which is it's attached to the actual part of the skeleton, which allows movement, you know, allows movement with the arms, legs being attached. These are the movable parts of the body. The different types of joints. So here we have the pivot, the ball and socket, hinge, gliding, conoid, and saddle. There's, can anyone tell me what type of joint a saddle joint is? Hence why I've left it out. It's in your thumb. It's yeah. in your thumb. Yes, yeah, um, what type of joint is it? What type of joint? I'm not sure. Okay. So no one knows in the class, you don't, you don't know? You don't know? Pivot joint allows you to rotate left and right like this. Ball and socket is a type of joint that allows different types of movement such as induction, abduction, extension, and circumduction all the way around. A hinge joint. What does a hinge joint allow? Flexion and extension. Can anyone name me a hinge joint? It's not good, just, you know, get, get you. Me? Do you want to do as well? Yeah, you go over there. The elbow. The elbow. Very good. The gliding joint. Gliding joint is rotation at the wrist, such as with the metacarpals, which allow rotation left and right like this. Connolly. Can anyone name me an example of a connolly? Set it up here. Yeah, that's that's great, that's great. At the finger, which is a type of hinge joint as well. So saddle, saddle, you ain't escape now, you come back to that. Your muscular system. You know, the muscles are, you know, a very important part of the body. You know. So yeah, let's start. The movement. Antagonistic pairs. Does anyone know 
What an antagonistic pair is. No, oh, no, you don't. You don't either. Oh, you sleep, man. Get up, son. <laughs> so, yeah, um, where two pairs, okay, not two pairs, two muscles working in a pair work together to create movement and exert force. An agonist, which is also known as a prime mover, it helps to, um, it's like, it's like we're recording in the classroom. It's, no, phones away, phones away, please. Phones away. An agonist, also known as a prime mover, for example, is a bicep, which is being worked as a result of the muscle moving. The antagonist is the opposite muscle, which is relaxing, which allows the muscle to actually stretch itself. The opposite muscle. A fixator. A fixator is a muscle that doesn't move but also plays a part in keeping stability whilst performing a muscle contraction or movement, allowing the action to be performed. A synergist is a muscle which works alongside the actual prime mover in order to assist with the actual action itself. So, an example would be when doing a bicep curl. I, yeah, I know you go gym. I saw you gym that said yesterday. Yeah. Yes, sir. And you two sat the back, yeah. For a bicep curl, <coughs> the prime mover, the agonist, is the bicep. You know, I know a lot of work in that team. You know, just haven't got in a while. Man. Problems at home and stuff. You know, <laughs> Well, the antagonist is the muscle that is relaxing, allowing, well, the one that's relaxing, stretching, allowing the prime mover to move, as a result of working together. And the fixator is the deltoid, which causes, which allows stability whilst performing the action, even though it doesn't really move itself. And the synergist in this one is the brachialis, which is a lot, okay, no. where is the brachialis? Can anyone tell? Namely, where it is? It's right next to the bicep, which allows, which assists in contraction of the bicep curl. If one muscle in an antagonistic pair was to be a torn, injured, or sore, the full contraction wouldn't be able to be performed, which wouldn't allow you to train. So it's always good to rest and recover after training and exercise. I know some of you just don't do it at all. You just go gym every day, you know. You just, yeah. And it's also important to allow muscles to rest, yeah, as what I said. If you may not feel the effects, injury could be knocking at your door around the corner. So it's always important to rest and recover after training. Traction, isometric. Has anyone done GCSE B here? Put your hands up. Oh, only one, two, three. Only one out of like 25 people. Okay. It's a type of strength training where the muscles exert force with no movement. So that's basically, for example, you know, the camera see me. I don't know if you can see me. Like this, holding a press up position for as long as you can with no movement, even though exerting force against the floor. It's <sighs> hot you. Anyone fall hot you? Isokinetic is where the muscles exert force with movement, for example, press ups, but at a consistent rate. So the opposite to isometric. Concentric and eccentric. Does anyone know what that is? No one? Only you? No one? Just looking dead today, looking flat. I didn't want to sleep last night. Mum would be. 
causes the muscle to shorten as it contracts. For example, when taking a shot, the muscles get shorter in order to perform this action. And like the bicep curl, when the muscle is working, it gets shorter in order to contract. Eccentric, eccentric is the opposite basically. It decelerates the motion of the opposite limb, the limb, sorry. Controlling the movement also. So if one of these was to get injured, per se, this wouldn't allow the actual action or contraction to occur properly. So it's also important to rest and recover, guys, after exercise, because injury might be at the door, right? Yeah. Whoa, muscle fibers. Muscle fibers. Does anyone know what type one does? No, no, no. Time to be easy. Does anyone know what type two A does? at home with all your, use everyone. We're going to start with tap one first. These fibres are slow twitch or slow oxidative fibres containing large amounts of myoglobin and my, many mitochondria. Mitochondria is very important for respiration within the muscles and many blood capillaries. For example, Okay, many blood capillaries for gases exchange very quickly, which is very important for long distance runners, such as people like Mo Farrell. Mo Farrell is one who needs a lot of mitochondria for respiration, and many blood capillaries for a lot of gases exchanges if you run it from over and over. Okay, he's a, he's a middle distance runner, by the way. Tap to your name. These fibers are fast twitch or fast oxidative fibers containing large, large amounts of myoglobin and very many mitochondria and very many blood capillaries. Type 2B, these fibers are kind of the opposite to type 1. They also contain fast twitch or fast glycotic fibers containing a low content of myoglobin and relatively few mitochondria. So this means what type of sport would this person take part in? Yeah, you. 100 meters. 100 meters. Correct, correct. Because of the fact he has a low amount of mitochondria, which means he wouldn't have enough for respiration. And 100 meters, 200 meters, short distance, short distance races wouldn't need that many amount of mitochondria because it's an aerobic and aerobic type of sporting event with relatively few blood capillaries and large amounts of glycogen. For example, found in large muscles, that's why you see a lot of sprinters having larger muscles for this case. For example, Usain Bolt. So, yeah, that's it really. We're just going to watch the video on muscle fibers. Yeah, that's it's just a little trick, you know. See my trick, you know. So, I'll take the difficulty. Yeah, these balls are very new and nice, and yeah. It's, my, it's, it's like my first time using them, okay, my first time.
down there. See at the bottom, bottom right corner. Bottom right corner, where's that? You can see it. See, it has a speaker. Bottom right corner of the whole screen. There's a speaker. First time you know you're using this. What's it called? Touching me, Jimmy Wizzy. No, no, no. I don't think it's even bringing these guys around. I don't think the guys I'm talking to anymore. Um, just imagine we've watched it and uh, finished up. After we choose the video then. Yes. I don't know which one. That one? What's the difference between tight walk fine muscle fibers yes. and the equally descript type? about these types of muscle fibers. So what I do is I get back at them. I come up with one golden rule. And this one golden rule will help me go through a table like we're about to do right here to differentiate between type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers. So the golden rule I'm going to have for this table here is that mitochondria, mitochondria, whoops, looks like I wrote that I there, mitochondria, are present in greater quantities in your type 1 muscle fibers. Type 1. So mitochondria are more prevalent in type 1 muscle fibers than in type 2. And just based on that knowledge alone, we should be able to go through and fill out this table. All right. So let's start from the top. I may have alluded to it here through the way I wrote this out, but the color type 1 muscle fibers are often noted as red. And why do you think that is? Well, what are mitochondria used for? Mitochondria are used in biochemical processes that help us make energy. And the main process they function in that I'm going to reference a couple of times is called oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation. Now what does that term mean to you? What does that suggest? What are the two things that are probably involved in oxidative phosphorylation. So, just as the name suggests, 